All right, everybody, uh, welcome back. Happy Tuesday. Uh, welcome back to another exciting session of CE 374U, Urban Stormwater. Uh, we will be starting momentarily. Uh, as you are walking in, note that I have brought uh, some Halloween candies for you. So feel free to take uh, as many as you want. Uh, go ahead and uh, grab any candies you want now uh, before we get started. Um, great. So, uh, Thank you for helping me get rid of these because I really don't want these uh, around the house. Um, so uh, just to give you some perspective, uh, we are really entering the home stretch of the class now. We have about a month left. Um, so basically just November and then the, the last uh, week will be in, in December. Uh, we're gonna miss basically a week of class for winter break. So we only have about six normal class sections left, including today. Um, and the rest of the class periods will be taken up by your presentations. So uh, we are, getting very close to kind of the end of the material that I'm going to be presenting for you. Uh, today, I'm going to finish up on the hydraulic design aspect of the class. We're going to finish up culverts uh, and look at detention basins, and then the rest of the course will be taken up by your course projects. Uh, yes? Will we have any more culverts here? No, I will post a extra credit homework assignment that will be worth I think I'll make it worth about half a normal homework assignment. Uh, and it'll be on EPA SWIM. Uh, and you can complete that by the final day of class for extra credit. For those of you who may not have done as well on a homework assignment as you would have liked. Uh, so it's kind of giving you an extra chance. Uh, but I won't be providing uh, a whole lot of assistance on it. It'll kind of be um, something for you to complete on your own. And I'll provide a recorded lecture on EPA SWIM because we don't have time in class for it, uh, but that, that opportunity will be available for you, okay? Yes. Is yes, it's a software that's kind of comparable to uh, HEC HMS mixed with HEC RASC kind of. So it's primarily meant for modeling urban drainage systems, uh, sewers, uh, pressurized sewer systems largely. So, yes. Okay. Uh, a couple quick announcements before I get started with uh, the content of today's lecture. So homework five will be due next Monday. Homework six will be due uh, November 15th. And office hours today, I'll be shifting to five o'clock. So five to six today for office hours. So uh, please come see me if you have any questions about either homework five or your course projects. Are there any questions? Other questions on course logistics or content before I move forward? Any questions? Any last questions? Okay, sounds good. Well, with that, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, a quick recap. So last time we talked about culverts with outlet control. So as you remember uh, from last week in culvert design, there are two primary types of culvert design we can do. Uh, culvert design for inlet control and culvert design for outlet control. Last week we covered outlet control and specifically we covered the design procedure for pressurized culverts or culverts that are submerged on both ends with the culvert flowing completely full. Um, and we solved that using, um, does anyone remember what equation we applied to uh, design culverts that are pressurized? Yes, the energy, the energy equation. So that's correct. Essentially all of the culvert design procedures are centered around the energy equation. Um, today we're going to very quickly finish up our discussion of culverts. 
I'm going to tell, uh, talk about what to do when you have culverts with outlet control that are not fully submerged on both ends. Uh, you, you have to use a numerical procedure called the direct step method. And then I'll quickly overview the overall culvert design procedure. Um, and then for the majority of today, we'll be working on detention ponds. And I'm going to go through a quick example that will be uh, useful for your homework. We're going to be doing it. Um, in class in Excel. So if you have brought your computers, uh, you can follow along and uh, we will be essentially working on a detention base and routing problem that's similar to the one in your homework. Okay, are there any questions before I move forward? Great. Okay, cool. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit um, before I move into detention bonds, I wanna kind of finish up our discussion of culverts. Um, so last time we talked about the design procedure for culverts flowing completely full. Um, there is one more case, which is the case of a culvert with outlet control that is not flowing completely full. Uh, and in this case, you have to apply what is called the direct step method, which is essentially a full backwater analysis within the culvert. Um, so I'm not going to go through this in detail. Essentially what it consists of is applying the energy equation across the culvert, but essentially what you do is you break the culvert up into small chunks and you apply the energy equation across each one of those chunks iteratively. So what I did, uh, because this isn't really something I can cover uh, as a problem that you can do yourself, it's something that you would have to write in code. Uh, I wrote a, software implementation that if you are curious, you can take a look at. Um, the important thing is that it, um, it essentially performs a backwater analysis, as I mentioned, by discretizing the energy equation across the culvert. Uh, and what you get is something that ends up looking like this. So this is very similar to the procedure that HECRAS uses. You essentially have a downstream boundary condition. So that's the depth at the downstream end. This can either be a tailwater uh, specified tailwater or a specified uh, critical depth at the downstream end. Um, what you do is you discretize the culvert into small discrete chunks. And across each of those chunks, you apply the energy equation. And what you end up with is a full backwater that looks like this. And from this, you can determine, you know, looking at the upstream end, what the headwater depth is. Okay. So if you're curious, uh, you can go ahead and take a look at this code. Um, it's a bit a bit more than I can really cover in this class, but uh, for those of you who want to specialize in hydraulics uh, moving forward, it could be uh, instructive instructive for you. okay? Uh, are there any are there any questions uh, quickly before I move on? So again, this is not something I'm going to evaluate you on, but for those of you who are curious, this is how you would do uh, culvert design for a culver with outlet control where you are not fully submerged, which is a pretty common case. So normally you would use a software uh, implementation to solve this. Are there any questions before I move on? Any questions? So again, this is called the direct step method. This is very similar to what HECRAS performs um, when it solves essentially this, this same procedure for an entire channel network. Um, the procedure used by HECRAS is a slightly different, it's called the standard step method, but it's, it's very similar to this procedure. And conceptually, it's just applying the energy equation across uh, a set of discretized chunks. Okay, cool. Great. So the last thing I wanna do on culverts is I just want to cover kind of the overall design procedure. So often this can be broken up um, into a flow chart. So that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna look at the overall design procedure for culverts. Okay, so essentially what you do is you first assume uh, the dimensions of the culvert. So let's say, let's say we have a circular culvert and we assume a diameter. We could also have a square culvert, in which case we would assume the uh, these rise in the span or the uh, width and the height of the culvert. 
And then essentially what we're going to do is we're going to assume inlet control applies. Okay. We're going to assume that inlet control applies. We are going to determine if the culvert is submerged or unsubmerged. And then we are going to apply the, uh, you know, the applicable inlet control design equation to compute our headwater depth. Okay, so we're going to compute, I'm going to write HWI. So that is the headwater depth, assuming inlet control. Next, what do you think we're going to do next? Okay, assume outlet control, right? So we're gonna consider both cases. We're going to assume outlet control. And then we have two different cases for outlet control. Does anyone remember what the two different cases were for outlet control? We kind of just mentioned it at the beginning of class. Uh, yes? Was it pressurized and unpressurized? Right, so either pressurized flow, meaning that it's submerged on both ends and flowing full, or is it simply subcritical throughout its length? So I'll just say, is it uh, partially full? Sorry, my handwriting is not great here. That, that says partially full. In the case of pressurized flow, we apply the energy equation as we performed in the last class. And if it's partially full, we perform the direct step method on a computer. And from that, we compute, we compute the headwater depth assuming outlet control, which I'll just denote HW with a O subscript. Okay. And the final step is we compare these two headwater depths and we let the design headwater depth um, be equal to the maximum of the headwater depth of assuming inlet control and the headwater depth, oops, I ran out of space here. And the headwater depth assuming outlet control. Okay, so we take that as our headwater depth, our true headwater depth. Finally, we check is our headwater depth less than our desired headwater depth. I'll just write that HW. Um, oh, let me write it HW max, because we're usually interested in a maximum allowable headwater depth. So we check if our headwater depth is less than our maximum allowable headwater depth. And if so, we are done. What do you think happens if, uh, if this condition doesn't hold? What do we have to do? Sorry? Yeah, we have to redesign. So we go back, we go back to this step here. And we, as you said, we redesign. So it's an iterative procedure. Um, essentially, in summary, we 
assume a diameter or assume a vertical dimension or a horizontal dimension uh, if needed. We assume inlet control and compute the headwater depth corresponding to the inlet control condition. We assume outlet control and compute the headwater depth corresponding to the outlet control condition. And then we take the true headwater depth as being the maximum of those two computed headwater depths. If it's less than the allowable headwater depth, we're done. Uh, and if not, we return and redesign the dimensions of the culvert. Cool. Are there any questions? Any questions about this procedure? No questions? What about the what about this here? Is anyone curious uh, why this is? Does anyone have any ideas? Why why is the headwater depth the maximum of the inlet control headwater depth and the outlet control headwater depth? Just more conservative options. Right. It's just it's essentially uh, 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 it allows the design to be conservative. I actually looked this up because there's not really a good explanation for where this comes from. If you go to the Federal Highway Administration uh, manual, they will say that essentially the design headwater depth is the maximum of these two. Um, and the reason they give is that, so they say the higher of the two is designated the controlling headwater elevation because the culvert can be expected to operate with that higher headwater for at least part of the time. So when we're doing culvert design, remember that we've kind of considered only static conditions, uh, but this is a dynamic system. So you're not, you know, the, the discharge is going to be changing over time. And so you may experience both inlet control or outlet control just depending on the time varying discharge in the system. Um, so again, yeah, as you mentioned, this is a, a conservative approximation that allows us to design the culverts to make sure that it doesn't overtop the roadway. So very good. Okay, are there any, any other questions on culverts? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the max, I, it, perhaps a better label would have been allowable. So that's your design headwater depth that your, um, that will essentially ensure that the roadway doesn't overtop. Yes, and the HW max is our design headwater depth, i.e. the headwater depth uh, above which overtop thing may occur or some other consequence that we want to avoid. Okay. Any other questions on culvert design before we move on? Any other questions? So this is our, this is our last uh, lecture on culvert design. You'll be dealing with culverts on your course project, but this is kind of the last, uh, we'll be taking a formal look at it in class. Okay. Very good. Well, let's go ahead and move on then. And today we are going to be primarily talking about stormwater ponds. All right, stormwater ponds. Okay, let's talk about ponds. Um, stormwater ponds are everywhere. They are one of the most versatile uh, types of stormwater infrastructure you'll see. Um, they can be used for all kinds of purposes. Many of you took pictures of stormwater ponds for your um, stormwater photo contest. So um, often they can serve as kind of aesthetic features within a neighborhood. Um, but stormwater ponds serve a variety of important purposes in urban uh, drainage design. Let's talk a bit about what the purposes of stormwater ponds are. and. Um, does anyone have an idea what kind of the main purposes of a stormwater pond are? What are the main purposes? Yes. Right. <laughs> We're gonna be talking about that exact uh, analogy later. So yes, that's very good. So um, 
to summarize, uh, a stormwater pond is kind of our uh, fundamental storage element in urban drainage design. It allows us to um, kind of smooth out the discharge within our channel network so that we can avoid flooding downstream. So that's very good. Um, that's a very good encapsulation of one of the main purposes for stormwater ponds. Um, are there any other ideas for what stormwater ponds are used for? They're used for a lot of different things, really. Um, yes. Water quality. Water quality, exactly. So that's the other, the other main purpose for stormwater ponds is that they can improve uh, water quality. Um, how do they do that? Right, sediments, right. Uh, so if you have a stormwater pond, um, often you'll have sediment coming in from upstream, either from natural or artificial sources, uh, like construction sites. And when it enters the stormwater pond, it gets a chance to settle out, um, much like a clarifier in a wastewater treatment plant. So the first stage in a wastewater treatment plant is typically, you know, after filters would be a, a clarifier or a sedimentation basin where the uh, sediments can settle out. Stormwater ponds do much the same thing for natural drainage systems. Uh, did you have an idea as well? Yeah, so that's, that's the other big one, right? So, um, so often the contaminants that are of concern uh, for cities are things like nitrates, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, because they can um, cause damage to aquatic ecosystems downstream. So stormwater ponds also have a variety of kind of biochemical processes within them that can um, kind of mediate nitrogen and phosphorus loads. Um, and kind of in a similar way to a wastewater treatment also treat those types of containments as well. Did you have a, another idea? Right. So yeah, so often, yeah. So there's kind of a continuum of different types of storage elements. So uh, a pond and a wetland and artificial wetland are kind of similar in that they both try to slow out, uh, slow down and spread out the flow uh, and also achieve some treatment, whether, um, you know, through plant life uh, or through kind of just raw physical processes like sedimentation. So yes, very good. Um, great. So, so basically you got, you got all the main uh, points. So the purpose of stormwater basins is to reduce peak flows and flooding. Oh, there's one other reason why we might want to reduce peak flows. Um, so we mentioned flooding. Is there another reason why we might, might want to reduce peak flows? Erosion. So we want to prevent erosion. Uh, detention ponds are kind of a first order tool for doing that. It's one of the best defenses against uh, erosion. Okay, uh, so they reduce peak flows and flooding and they improve water quality, uh, either by limiting erosion or by actually facilitating treatment in the pond itself. So let's talk about the different types of ponds. This is just gonna go through some terminology here. Um, there are a couple of main types of ponds I wanna talk about. The first are dry ponds, uh, what I'll call dry detention facilities. So these are normally dry, um, they'll store rainfall after large rainfall events, uh, typically for about 24 to 48 hours. There are wet ponds or wet detention facilities. Um, and essentially these are like dry ponds in that they're meant for kind of temporary storage of stormwater, but they have a permanent pool of water that can be used for enhancing uh, nutrient and sediment removal. Um, and they can also be used for aesthetic purposes as well. Uh, and then finally, we have retention ponds. Um, so what's the difference between detention and retention ponds? Does anyone know? It's kind of kind of mentioned here. Yes. Yeah. Right, so I'll show a couple pictures of 
these two different types of ponds in a second, but detention ponds typically have an outlet structure that lets water continuously flow out. Uh, whereas retention ponds don't have a permanently opened outlet structure. They kind of just keep the water inside of the pond. Uh, they don't really have an outlet. Okay. Uh, and those are used um, you know, for various purposes, but one of the main ones is groundwater recharge or for um, preventing contaminants from entering the drainage network that you don't want to get in the drainage network. So like hazardous materials like uh, um, oil, things like that, motor oil, uh, other contaminants you don't want in the, in the actual natural drainage system. Okay, so let me go through just a couple pictures conceptually of what these look like. So this is a traditional dry detention pond. So this would be empty most of the time. Uh, it's just a, a big storage element, a big pond. You have some inflow coming in. Uh, you have an outflow structure. So this would be like a pipe, a culvert or an orifice. And you have some overflow structure in case of a very large storm event that may overwhelm the outlet structure. Um, that would be like a like a spillway usually, and as uh, as we mentioned before, the primary purpose of this structure is to kind of uh, reduce peak flows, uh, reduce downstream erosion, uh, prevent flooding, and that sort of thing. Um, so note that dry ponds should typically be grassed. If not, they can develop into dust bowls, and the dust blows around and become a nuisance. Um, I should note also that I I grew up in um, Arizona. And I don't know if they have the same thing here, but in Arizona, pretty much all of the municipal parks were also dry ponds. So when they went to go build a park, they would just kind of cut out a big, uh, you know, cut out a big uh, bowl in the ground, and it would they would just install like playground equipment inside of it. So it'd be kind of a a, a dry pond first and a park second. So they do similar things in Austin. Often parks will be found kind of in low-lying areas, but in Arizona, they were, they were pretty clearly uh, actually just ponds uh, that were empty most of the time. Okay, um, so next we have wet ponds, wet detention ponds. So these are very similar to dry ponds, except they have some sort of structure at the outlet that prevents the main pond from completely emptying. So there'll be kind of a permanent pool um, so these are used for aesthetic purposes. Uh, people like water features. Um, they can be used for recreation. Um, and they also help to um, achieve some of these treatment processes we're talking about, both in terms of sedimentation uh, and also removing nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. Typically, they require some sort of pumping or aeration. So you'll often see fountains uh, in these types of ponds. Uh, here's a couple, here's a picture of a wet pond. This one is in Michigan, and this was a site that was used in my graduate research. So you can kind of see the pond uh, in the foreground of the picture. Um, it looks just like a natural pond. And at the outlet, you have this kind of outlet structure. Um, and inside of it, you have a orifice. But in this case, we actually installed a real-time control valve that can you know, actively empty or retain water within the pond. Uh, here's some images of that uh, outlet in action. So on the right, you have the, what the pond looks like after a big storm event. So you can see the outlet structure is completely, um, you know, uh, completely inundated. Uh, and on the inside, when you open up the valve, you get kind of the spout of water coming out. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure built up there. This is what that wet pond will look like when it is uh, completely full. Um, here's, a, here's just another example of a, of a pond. This is a wet pond. Um, and you have similarly another type of valve on this one, as well as an overflow structure, which is this kind of uh, weir here. Uh, so this is, yeah, just a couple of images of what a wet pond looks like. Well, are there any questions on wet ponds? Cool. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There can be. So this was in Michigan. Um, there were there were more more fish there than there probably would be here. I don't think fish would. I mean, it was less it was less developed, less urban there as well. And so there were definitely fish swimming around in this pond. 
And this one, this one connects directly to the, the nearest creek, basically. It's, it, it's probably full of chemicals too, but, um, but there's still fish in there, yeah. Uh, probably not. I mean, uh, I wouldn't. Yeah. But yeah, there can be fish in these, yeah. <laughs> cool. So the last kind of pond that I want to talk about is retention ponds. So these are basically almost the same as detention ponds, except there's no permanent outlet structure. So these will just kind of capture water and retain it indefinitely. Uh, they're used for, as I mentioned, kind of percolation, so recharging the groundwater table, and also um, they can be used as hazardous material traps to prevent contaminants from entering uh, the natural drainage network. So uh, most ponds will be kind of in line with the nearest uh, natural drainage channel. So you'll often um, have a configuration like the above where you have uh, flow coming in from a creek or a kind of a smaller channel. Uh, it enters the pond and then just comes out of the pond. Um, however, you can also have bypass channels that allow uh, these can also be actively controlled, but kind of allow high flows to go through um, without overflowing the pond. And ponds can also be placed as a diversion from the main channel where you have um, kind of a side channel coming out. The pond is a diversion structure that only fills up during large storm events and then enters back into the, the main channel. So this is a configuration that you might actually want to think about for your projects because it can be helpful for reducing uh, flooding. And it's uh, potentially even more effective if you have real-time controls so that you can let water in only when it's needed. Um, right. So what are the main purposes of ponds? I briefly touched on this, um, but one, one big aspect of detention ponds is that they help smooth out the hydrologic response. Uh, or as uh, as you mentioned earlier, they help to kind of flatten the curve uh, when it comes to the hydrograph. So um, when you performed your, uh, your lab or kind of your in-class exercise with HEC HMS, what did you notice about what happened to the hydrologic response when you increased the impervious area? How did the hydrologic response or the hydrograph downstream change? when you increase the amount of impervious cover. Right, you have a higher peak. And what else about that? What else about that new hydrograph? So you have a very high peak. Yes. And it occurs faster, right? So you kind of have a, you have the same amount of water potentially coming through, but you'll have a very high peak and it will occur very rapidly. And both of those can have negative effects. Uh, you may get flooding. Uh, and if you have a very fast incoming peak with a large amount of flow at a high velocity, you can also cause uh, erosion problems. So one of the big goals we want to achieve with the tension ponds and what we're going to be examining in class today is we use the detention ponds in order to kind of flatten the curve or kind of smooth out that rapid uh, hydrograph peak. That's one of the primary purposes of uh, detention ponds. Another big, uh, another big important aspect of detention ponds is that they can potentially capture what are called first flush contaminants. So who's, who's heard the term first flush before? Does anyone heard the term first flush? Does anyone have a guess for what it means? Right. So this is, yeah, this is kind of um, kind of a theory in stormwater management. Um, it's somewhat contentious recently, but the idea is that, you know, in between storm events, you'll have this buildup of contaminants on the surface of roadways, parking lots, sidewalks. Uh, where you have buildup of substances like motor oil, sediments, uh, things that you don't want in your natural drainage channels. And when the rainfall occurs, you'll get a big uh, load of contaminants early on 
when that material gets washed off the surface. So a detention basin could potentially help to trap that first flush of contaminants and help it settle out. Uh, so that's another important aspect of uh, first uh, detention basin design. Yes? So it's unclear whether this theory actually holds in practice. Um, and part of the issue is that there's kind of a lack of data on contaminants in urban drainage systems. So to typically to collect this data, you have to either go out and sample it, especially for contaminants that you can't measure in situ. Um, but there is some there is some evidence that suggests that the peak of the pollutograph coincides with the peak of the hydrograph. So there isn't kind of this early first flush effect in some in some cases. Uh, so it's it's contentious, but I'd say most most urban drainage man management assumes that it operates with this first flush principle. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty in this in this area of hydrology and urban stormwater in general, just because there's very few measurements. Yeah. So good question. Okay. Cool. So, are there any questions on kind of detention basins? conceptually uh, and what they are for, what we want to design them to do. Any questions? So next, uh, what I want to do is I want to take you through kind of a conceptual detention basin design problem where we can kind of examine this phenomena of slowing out and kind of smoothing out the peak of a hydrograph. Uh, and we're gonna do this kind of from first principles. So there's various empirical methods for designing detention basins, but I'm going to show you kind of a, uh, uh, a conceptual technique we can use that will apply in any case you can think of, okay? So we're, gonna, we're going to specifically look at detention basin routing. So what we're going to do in this exercise is we are going to have a detention basin. We're going to have some post-development inflow. So when I say post-development, I mean kind of the hydrograph as it would occur after uh, an area has been developed uh, and it has been covered with impervious area. So we're going to have a detention basin with some post-development inflow hydrograph. And we are going to look at what the outflow from the detention basin will be after designing it to determine if it can help achieve kind of a pre-development inflow hydrograph. So we're going to look at the potential for a detention basin to essentially restore the hydrograph to pre-development conditions. Okay, so let's let's kind of take a look at a conceptual detention basin problem. So let's say we have a detention basin we're gonna just treat it as kind of like a cylindrical tank. So this is kind of an abstract representation of the detention basin. We have a detention basin here. Uh, it's fed by some channel. Okay, so there'll be some water coming in. I'm gonna call this Q in. we have that the detention basin has some water level in it. Let's say that the bottom area of the detention basin, I'm just gonna call it A. And let's say that the detention basin as an outlet. So this might be a uh, orifice, for example, and the outflow from the detention basin as it goes downstream, we'll call that Q out. We'll call the water level above the centroid of the orifice H. Okay, now let's kind of think of, um, what would happen if we applied continuity 
to this detention base. And let's kind of look at it just from first principles. Let's apply continuity to this detention base. And what does continuity state again? Sorry? So that would be continuity if the pond was at steady state, right? So what would it be for the unsteady case? Yes? Exactly. So let's write that out mathematically. We have that the change in volume over the change in time is equal to Q in, and I'll just say Q in as a function of time, minus Q out as a function of time. Okay, and the, the pond is a roughly cylindrical in shape. So we can express the change in volume is equal to what? So we have the depth in the pond, right? Exactly. So the change in volume in the pond is equal to the area times the change in height. That's exactly right. So we can go back and we can rewrite this first equation, just substituting in our expression for dv. Uh, we end up with A times dh dt is equal to Q in T minus Q out T. Uh, and let's go ahead and divide through by A so that we have our dh by dt all alone on the left-hand side. And we end up with dh by dt, the change in depth of the pond with respect to change in time is equal to uh, the inflow minus the outflow divided by the bottom area. Okay, now we're going to do something similar to what we did on homework two. Let's approximate this derivative uh, by discretizing it. So let's say that dh by dt. Let me just write it over here. dH by dt is approximately equal to h at time t plus delta t minus h at time t divided by delta t. Okay, and if we do that, what we end up with is the depth at time t plus delta t minus the depth at time t divided by delta t is equal to inflow q in minus outflow q out divided by a, the bottom area of the pond. OK, so if we want to simulate this system, so if we want to go and go and simulate this system in Excel or in a programming language, what can we do? Let's assume we know some initial depth in the pond. What can we do here? How can we rearrange this equation so that we can simulate the depth in the pond over time? So similar to a problem you did on homework two. Yes. So you just isolate a sequence of all the two because you know what a is. And you know what is so you can just solve for that. So it would be like that will left on the right plus delta t plus delta t. Exactly. So we can take this h at time t plus delta t. We can isolate it on the left hand side. And then if we know the depth at the previous time step, we can compute the depth at each uh, incremental next time step. So let's go ahead and write that equation out. Let's go and write this equation out. So we have that the depth at time t plus delta t is equal to the depth at time t plus, and then rearranging our previous expression, we have delta t over a, which we're just going to assume is constant right now, times 
the inflow minus the outflow or Q in T minus Q out of T. Okay, so the inflow is something that will come from outside the system. So um, it's not necessarily something that, this, that can be controlled or that we know a priori. What about the outflow though? Can we come up with an expression for the outflow? Can we come up with an expression for the outflow that depends on the depth in the pond? So we have that the outflow is being generated by an orifice. What a, can we come up with an expression for the outflow from the pond? Does anyone remember the orifice equation? Anyone want to take a guess at the orifice equation? There's no, no shame in not getting it right. So yes. Yes. Uh, so the outflow, so I'll say from the orifice equation, we have that the outflow from the pond is equal to, I'll write it as, um, well, actually, yeah. I'll just write it like this. It'll be equal to CO, so this is the orifice coefficient, times AO, this is the cross-sectional area of the orifice, times square root of 2GH. Okay, so let's make this explicit. So this is Q out at time T, and this is our depth at time T. Right, so we can substitute that back in here. Now there's one more thing we need to specify and that is our inflow hydrograph. So this is our, this is going to be our post-development inflow hydrograph. It's kind of the peaky hydrograph that we want to smooth out. So I will just give um, a hydrograph for the purposes of this problem. Let's say we have the, I'll just call it the uh, design hydrograph. And I'll just specify it in terms of a graph here. So this is Q in. This is time, and it's going to be a triangle. So let me write out here, here. The inflow hydrograph is going to be a triangle. Okay. It's going to peak at a value of 30 minutes, so it's gonna peak at 30 minutes. So I'll write this out as 1,800 seconds. And I don't have enough room to write 30 minutes here. Uh, just know that this is 30 minutes. And it's gonna end at one hour or 3,600 seconds. And let's say that the peak inflow is going to be 180 CFS. Okay, so this is our design inflow hydrograph. We can write, yes. Yeah, so I kind of glossed over this. Um, so in detention, Pond design, what we want to do is we want to take um, the hydrograph corresponding to the developed, uh, like kind of post development conditions where it's going to be very rapidly peaking and high peaking. And we want to try to restore it to pre development conditions. So, um, you know, prior to prior to development occurring, prior to housing developments being installed, the hydrograph will kind of be, you know, generally kind of slow and low. 
Uh, and after development, it will be rapid and high peaking. What we want to do is we want to design the detention basin to try to restore that pre-development hydrograph. And we'll see that uh, when we go to simulate this in a second. So we can write this out as a piecewise function. Our QN is going to be equal to, if you find the slope, this slope will be about 0 0.1 uh, cubic feet per second per second. So QN will be equal to 0 0.1 times T for zero less than equal to T less than equal to 1800 seconds. It will be equal to 0 0.1 times 3600 minus T for you know, T between 1800 and 3600 seconds. And it'll be zero otherwise. Okay, so we can come up with a mathematical function for the inflow hydrograph. And let's go ahead and just specify a couple other parameters here. I'm gonna say that our area of the pond is going to be 10,000 square feet. Our orifice coefficient is going to be 0 0.67, which is kind of the standard coefficient. Um, our orifice cross-sectional area is going to be four square feet. And are there any other parameters I need here? Um, I'll just say G, the gravitational constant is gonna be 32.2 because .2 we're in US units. Uh, yes, feet per second squared. And with that, we can go ahead and simulate this. I'm gonna go and do this in Excel. So you can follow along on your computers if you'd like to. This will be helpful for your homework. Um, so I'm gonna go and simulate this system to see how the detention basin changes the uh, hydrologic response. In particular, I wanna look at the outflow from the retention basin. I wanna compare it to the inflow to see how it's kind of modulating that inflow hydrograph. And uh, I haven't used Excel in a while, so I'm a bit rusty. Um, so I'll do, I'll do my best here. And after this, I will give you a couple uh, challenge problems to work on. I'm gonna have to exit out of this. All right, let's zoom in. That's probably a bit too zoomed in. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to simulate this detention pond using the equations I specified earlier. And let me just get my notes ready here. So we're going to need four columns in our Excel workbook. Uh, note that you can also do this in Python, and I posted the Python uh, script up in the code folder on Canvas if you want to use that. Uh, I'm going to do it in Excel uh, just so you can follow along more easily. So we have four columns. We're going to have a column for the time T. We're going to have a column for QN. We're going to have a column for H, the depth in the pond. And we're going to have a column for Q out. And let's define some constants over here. So I'm going to have DT is going to be 60, so we're gonna be working at 60 second uh, time intervals. Our area, the bottom area of the pond is gonna be 10,000. The area of the orifice cross section is going to be four square feet. The orifice coefficient is going to be the standard 0 0.67. And our gravitational acceleration is gonna be 32.2. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is define a time range. Yes. Sorry. Okay. There's going to be some plots uh, soon, so it may I may have to zoom back out, but 
Uh, here you go. Is that better? This text box is going to be really small. Um, so follow along as best as you can. Um, okay, so for the time we're working in 60 second increments. So I'm going to create these first two rows, zero and 60, and then I'm going to drag all the way out to 7,200 seconds, which will be at row around 122. Okay, so I'm, uh, I created a column of time, our time step from zero to 7,200 in 60 second increments. Okay, and let's put in our values for the inflow hydrograph. Um, if you have questions, um, maybe try to see if you can get Becky to help you as well. Uh, she should have the uh, full Excel workbook for this. Um, so for Q in, from zero to 100, uh, 1,800 seconds, we're gonna have 0 0.1 times T is our inflow hydrograph. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna drag it down to 1,800. So this defines our inflow to the basin. So you can see that it goes up to about 180 cubic feet per second. And then from 1,800 to 3,600, it's going to be the receding limb. So we can represent this as 0 0.1 times 3600 minus T. Okay, and I'm gonna drag this down to 3600. There we go. And then for the rest of them, it's just gonna be zero. So I'll go and fill that out with zeros. Any questions on how I specified the inflow hydrograph? Yes. Uh, zero. Oh, um, so from zero to one, uh, 1800. So 0 0.1 times the time row to the, to the left. Okay, and now we have to simulate the depth in the pond. So this is gonna be using that equation we had before. So this will be the trickiest of the cells. Uh, I will leave this up for a little while so that you can get it. Um, actually, first, you know what, let's go ahead and plot. Let's go ahead and plot the inflow hydrograph. So I'm gonna to go to insert. I'm gonna create a uh, chart. Oh, and it selected my data for me already. Um, so I'm going to call this chart um, discharge. I'm going to remove this H column. Okay. And we're going to be plotting Q in and Q out. Uh, let me just go and label this correctly. So the Horizontal axis will be time in seconds. And the vertical axis will be uh, discharge in cubic feet per second. And let me add a legend here. Okay, very good. And I need to move this out of the way temporarily, but you should have an inflow hydrograph that looks something like this should be a triangle uh, peaking at 180 cubic feet per second at 30 minutes. So I'm gonna move this down. And now we need to do the hardest part, which is to figure out what the depth is at each time step. So we have an initial depth of zero at time zero. And for the remainder of the time steps, we need to use that equation that we specified earlier. Uh, and I closed out my open board program, but I will write it out for you in this cell here. Okay. So we have that our depth at time step one is equal to, what's the first term? 
what's the first term? So we had that H T plus Delta T is equal to H T plus Delta T over A times Q and minus Q out, right? So what the, what's the first term going to be in terms of the cells that I need to select? We're selecting H at the previous time step. Yeah, so we need to select this cell. So that's our H at the previous time step. Okay. And then we need to add the following term. We have DT divided by A. Oops, I can't look like that. So let me go and select DT. I'm gonna make this an absolute cell reference. Divided by A. I'm gonna make this an absolute cell reference. I'm sorry about the small text size here. Um, I didn't realize it was gonna be so small on the screen, but what I've done is I've selected um, DT divided by A as the first term. And then I'm going to multiply this by our expression for Q in minus Q out. So how can we get Q in? We need Q in at time T, right? So it'll be, it'll actually, I think technically it needs to be B2 because it's Q in at time T, which is the previous time step. So I'm going to select B2 minus, and now we need our, our expression for Q out. So can, I, can anyone remind me what Q out is? Right, it's the orifice equation. So can anyone uh, say what the orifice equation is in this case? Exactly. So we need C naught times A naught times the square root of 2G times H at the previous time step. Okay. So let's do that. We have C naught. times A naught times, I'm gonna use the square root function, SQRT of two times, I'm just gonna write 32.2 times, and then I need to select which cell. It will be, uh, C2, okay, and let's pray that this works. Okay, and so I've got a series of depths from, let's see, from about zero to 7,200. I may have an error in here that I need to debug. So let's, Let's now just specify our um, Q out column. So what will Q out be equal to? We can get it from which column? H, right? So Q out is equal to CO times AO times square root of 2GH, right? So we can just compute Q out as follows. We have the orifice coefficient times the orifice cross-sectional area times the square root of two times 32.2 times H. Okay, and we can go ahead and expand that. And we get something that looks like the following. So let me know if you were able to obtain, yes? We could do it. I just wanted to make it easier for presentation here. Oh, okay. it, it would be, more, yeah, it'd be more efficient to pre-compute Q. Well, actually, no, you can't, because that would be Q out at the previous time step. Yeah, so uh, they'll be very close, but they're slightly different, yeah. So, you should end up with a plot that looks like this. Is anyone having any issues getting a plot that looks like this? 
Okay, so what do you notice about the inflow compared to the outflow? What do you notice about the inflow compared to the outflow? Just, uh, just in general terms. The outflow is less, yes. So we were able to design the pond such that we get a discharge like roughly peaking around 80 cubic feet per second compared to the initial discharge, which is about 180 cubic feet per second. Um, now note that you can go here and you can redesign this pond. So let's say we wanna change the bottom area to 20,000. And you note that the peak discharge goes even lower. If you change the bottom area to 5,000, you'll get a peak discharge that's a bit higher. Okay, let's set it back at 10,000. Similarly, you can change the orifice area. So if we change this to two square feet, for instance, the pond, uh, you know, the discharge is much smaller, um, but you also get that the depth in the pond increases quite a bit. So in this case, the depth of the pond needs to be about 21 feet deep. So you have to consider both the, um, the depth in the pond as well as the discharge you want to achieve. Okay. Is anyone having any issues getting to this point? Uh, is it any, anyone having any trouble with the, uh, the Excel code? No? Okay, well with that, I wanna give you an exercise to work on. Um, so you're gonna use the Excel sheet you just created, but I want you to take a look at the following, um, take a look at the following problems. Okay, so you have a little less than 10 minutes to do this. Um, first, using your Excel sheet and keeping the orifice area constant, I want you to find the smallest pond area I want you to find the smallest pond area that limits peak discharge. Below 50 cubic feet per second. And second, uh, the same problem, except instead of limiting peak discharge below 50 cubic feet per second, I want you to limit the pond depth below 10 feet. And if you finish these problems, you can also try to adapt the Excel workbook to solve your homework problem three, okay? So go ahead and take uh, the last couple of minutes of class to take a look at those problems, okay? And I'll walk around to help as needed.